Come on, Deacon. How you doing today? Good morning. Okay. And there's the Lebanese guy I was talking about. Uh, welcome, Chris. Glad you could make it today. All right. Uh, I did this whole thing about Lebanese culture during the intro, bro. That's all right. And we don't call you out if you're late either. Okay. Look. Uh, welcome. Let's get to it. It's preaching time. Go ahead and grab your Bible. Open them up with me. The Matthew chapter six. We'll be studying verses 19 through 24 this morning. Don't have a copy of God's Word? Just raise your hand, and one of our Beacon Hill team members will bring you a copy of God's Word. We believe strongly in having the Word open as it is preached. Uh, it's not my words that will change your life, but the word that I preach that can change anybody's life in here. So make sure you get a copy of the word and follow along. I'd like to welcome our online community under the direction of Ben Wright. If you have any questions, make sure you write them down there. We're thankful uh, Ben Wright started leading us, um, moderating our online service right before COVID. He's been thankful to do that every week. So type hi, Ben, in there. I know some watch it online, some watch it in repeat, and we, uh, we appreciate you tuning in. Right now, if you're able, I invite you to stand in honor of reading God's Word. Matthew 6, 19 through 24. The Word says, Don't store up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal. But store up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroys and where thieves don't break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. The eye is the lamp of the body. If your eye is healthy, your whole body will be full of light. But if your eye is bad, your whole body will be full of darkness. So if the light within you is darkness, how deep is that darkness? No one can serve two masters since either he will hate one and love the other, or he will be devoted to one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and money. Let us pray. Dear Holy Father, we thank you and praise you uh, for today. We thank you for the blessing to be able to be here and just worship you. Lord, we are imperfect people serving a perfect God. And so, Lord, um, I pray this morning that if someone is here today and they're just hurting, and they're broken, and they don't know which way to turn, and don't even know how they got here today. Lord, I pray that they would come to know the love of Christ this morning. Lord, for... Those in here who are saved and who do know you, I pray that they would they would see this message and hear it and take it to heart and, or make adjustments in their life where they need to uh, to make sure that their their treasures are in the right place. Lord, may I decrease and you increase and you get all the glory in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Can y'all bring me a bottle of water? I have a title today's message, Christian Treasure Hunting. I thought about Thank you very much, Dennis. I uh, thought about as uh, as an analogy to use one of those Nicolas Cage movies. Y'all seeing that? They're talking about Christian treasure hunting. But I thought instead, I was like, well, let me talk about, like, what do you think? What do you think is, like, one of the biggest threats to Christianity in America today? What do you think? If I was to ask you. Social media, that could be one. I was thinking some people would say Islam. Like the rise of the number of Muslims here. Uh, that's one that I immediately thought about. You know, Islam is the fastest growing religion yeah. in America. And matter of fact, within the next 15 years, it is slated to be the number two religion in America. It is far outpacing the growth of Christianity. So I saw about, you know what? That that's that's like a threat to Christianity. And then I thought maybe as much as I, I study this. It could be the nuns. You heard of the nuns? Not not like Catholic nuns. I'm talking about N O O N E S nuns. All right. These are people that have no affiliated uh, religion at all. They don't they don't really belong to anything. They just check out. See, even with Islam being the number two religion in America, in short order, it is still only projected to be about eight million in the U.S. with Islam. The number of nuns, the number of people who don't associate with any religion at all, will account for 100 million people in the U.S. shortly. 100 million people who have no identity with any religion at all. So when I look at these two, when I look at Islam and the nuns, if you just had to pick one of the two, you would say that the nuns would be the greatest threat to Christianity in America. Now, to be fair, there is... Never any threat to Christianity in America. 
Jesus Christ is still on the throne. Yeah. He is the King of Kings. He is the Lord of Lords. Yeah. Now we make no mistake about that. Christianity is going nowhere. But if I was to say, if I had to pick what is the, the greatest threat to Christianity in America, I wouldn't say it's Muslims, I wouldn't say it's nuns, I would say the greatest threat to Christianity in America are Christians. Christians who are more in love with this world than they are in love with the one who came and conquered the world, Jesus Christ. Christians who... who uh, have the wrong mindset, the wrong heart, the wrong will. See, all of Matthew chapter 6, that's why we go through the scripture. All of Matthew chapter 6 is trying to recenter ourselves on Christ. That is the purpose of Matthew chapter 6, to live a life that is pleasing to the Lord. When you look at prayer, and we spent about uh, five or six weeks on prayer, it was like, man, don't worry about what other people think about your prayer life. If that's the focus, then, then go into a prayer room, shut the door, and pray to your Lord in secret, and He will reward you. And then we talked about fasting. We talked about fasting last week. Like, don't go around just making all these gloomy faces, like looking like it's a painful thing to fast, to seek God's will. As I reach the last half of chapter 6, the teaching is still in the realm of trying to please the Lord, but it's talking about when it comes to material things. This is what we're going to talk about this week. It's talking about greed, and next week we're going to talk about anxiety. Is anybody struggle with anxiety? Yeah. Don't miss next week, all right? Don't get anxious about it. It'll come, all right? So look. Both come about due to a lack of trust in God. All this comes about is a lack of trust in God. And so Matthew chapter 6, if I had to just sum it up into one sentence in a nutshell, is that we need to look up when our natural tendency is to look around. So when you want to look around at what the world is doing, you just need to look up and know that God is still doing what God does. We need to trust in God. So let's dive in into this passage. What I believe is one of the greatest threats to Christianity in America. We see that earthly treasures often sway our hearts. Don't they? Earthly treasures kind of sway our hearts. So what it says in verses 19 through 21. It says, don't store up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal. But store for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroy and where thieves don't break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. What are those uh, cedar, is it cedar line closets? Is that what they are? Why, why do we have cedar line closets? To keep moths out. Because what do moths do? They destroy good clothing. You know, not, yeah, they destroy good clothing. And so, like the, the high quality stuff, Coles, Coles brand, stuff like that. <laughs> so moths can tend to break in and, and, and destroy clothing. And then the other thing that really bothered them back then was rust. When things come in and things rust out, they, they become dangerous and they become no good. And so there were things that they dealt with back in these times. But we have a lot of other things that we have to deal with. And so when we look at... at that earthly treasures and how they sway us, we have to look at what are we doing with these things. And so I thought about earthly treasures and moth and rust, and we have a lot of things that, that are really fleeting in our life. And a lot of us, we have so much value into earthly things, don't we? I mean, think about it. We have to upgrade our iPhones. And who saw the flip phone in here? You are my people, all right? That's good. Both of you. All right? That's good. I heard a story about Lisa and Steve Holland. This is a crazy story. They bought their dream piece of land in 2019 to prepare for retirement. And because COVID was coming, uh, they, they literally decided, let's move to our dream piece of land. It was in the mountains, a, a whole wooded place. And they moved to it early uh, because they could work out of their house. Everybody worked out of their house back then. And so they were able to buy an RV and they decided to build their dream home early. And so the husband spent 12 to 15 hours a day building their dream house, using their life savings to, to build it. And they knew the area was prone to forest fires, so they spent $50,000 on a fire-resistant roof. And so the wife worked all day in the RV, the husband built the house, and it became time almost within days 
for them to move into their new house. So there was a forest fire that was in the area, but they were promised it wasn't going to come close to them. And so what they did was they went to the store to run some errands. And in the 10 minutes they were gone, their house burned up in flames. Not only their house, but their RV as well. Now, no problem, right? They had insurance. Insurance is going to cover it. Insurance is great, right? But the problem with it is you can't get homeowner's insurance until your house is complete and you get a certificate of occupancy. So all they could have was a builder's risk policy. And so a lifetime of work. They spent all $1 million that they had saved. They even gave up vacations for five years to pour everything that they had into their dream home. And it was gone in 10 minutes. All they're left with is $40,000 from a GoFundMe page and an RV that the bank president in town has lent them. Earthly treasures are fleeting church. Earthly treasures can be gone in a minute. Moth and rust and other elements of life can take those things away in an instant. We all have our stories where we, we put up trust in earthly things and we see it gone in an instant. We have thieves, which is the other analogy that they use here. Moth and rust are not the only things to worry about. Theft was a big problem in the early church. Most of the people lived in mud and brick homes, and so it's easy for, for thieves to literally get in and break and steal everything that they have. Now, in modern times, we think, like, they came out with ring doorbell. Who has, like, a ring doorbell or equivalent today, right? You can see what's coming in. Now, that doesn't help stop a thief if you're on vacation 300 miles away, does it? You can watch them steal your stuff. <laughs> but in modern times, that's not the only danger to our treasures. We have something called cyber fraud. We have bank failures that can take away money in an instant. Stock market taking can change your financial security. Jesus is challenging his followers here to not have their heart focused on earthly things. In fact, he commands us not to hoard earthly treasures. Instead, he wants us to focus on storing up heavenly treasures, church. Treasures that the elements of life and thieves can't take away from you. So let's talk about heavenly treasures in verse 20. See, earthly treasures are easy to spot, right? Earthly treasures are very, very easy to spot. A lot of you have your earthly treasures in vehicles, and they're outside today. You can see where your treasures are. But from the poorest of the poor to the richest of rich, we all have something that we treasure in life, don't we? We all have something that is very, very important to us. We all have things that, that we put value on. That begs the question, what are exactly heavenly treasures? Because you can point out an earthly treasure in your life, but what are heavenly treasures? 1 Peter 1.4 tells us that through the hope that is in Christ Jesus, death and resurrection, we have an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, and unfading, kept in heaven for us. Let me tell you something. I have preached many of funerals for people with earthly riches. And it's sad to see how quick people with earthly treasures fight over who's going to get what before their loved one is even in the grave, before I even preach the sermon. It's a sad reality. It shows us what our focus is on. But Jesus, but Jesus in 1 Peter chapter 1 is talking about an inheritance that cannot be broken up, an inheritance that does not have an expiration date and will not fade away, church, an inheritance that is death-proof, an inheritance that is sin-proof, an inheritance that is time-proof. As children of the King, we share in His inheritance. We share in His glory. We are in His last will and testament, church. What is, what is this inheritance? It's the glorification of our salvation. The, the day that we are with Jesus, worshiping Him every single second of every single day. And I don't know about you, I can't wait for that day to come. Think about four of y'all are with me on that. That's great. 
The rest of y'all really need to tune in to what I'm saying here. <laughs> you think the treasure that Jesus is talking about is just about you? I mean, you're important to God. You're valuable to God. But you think that the treasure that Jesus is talking about is just about you? See, don't store up for yourselves treasures on earth. We're both of us for But store up for yourselves treasures in heaven. The heavenly treasures that he's talking about is telling others about the most valuable thing that they can ever learn in life, and that is Jesus Christ. The most important course in college is not about economics, it's not about science, it's not about math, it's about Jesus Christ. That is the only thing that people need to know about the one who came down from heaven, who was born of a virgin, who lived the life that we could live and died the death that we should have died so that we could have an eternity with him. That God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that, that whosoever shall believe in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. Let me ask you a question. What is your treasure this morning? Is your treasure things of this world that are fleeting? Or is your treasure those things that are kingdom oriented? If your treasure and your ultimate aim is striving to obtain and build things in this world, you'll be completely absorbed in that which is temporary instead of things that are eternal. You can't do both. You can't do both, church. I'm just reading the word here. Verse 21 says, For your, where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Your heart can't be in two places at once. So don't let earthly treasure sway your heart. We've got to live to provide for our family. We've got to live to help others. And we've got to live to advance the kingdom of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Church. That's what we're called to do. <laughs> earthly treasures can sway the heart, but earthly treasures distort your vision. This is what it says in verses 22 through 23. So it's the eye is the lamp of the body. If your eye is healthy, your whole body will be full of light. But if your eye is bad, your whole body will be full of darkness. So if the light within you is darkness, how deep is that darkness? The natural question will come up for a lot of people on the first few verses. Is it wrong to have nice things, church? Is it wrong to have is it wrong to be rich? No, it's not wrong to be rich. For the record, even the poorest person in here, the poorest person in America, is still richer than 90% of the world. So if, even if you feel like you're poor, it's because you're comparing yourself to everybody else. You know, Christ, you're the richest person in here. So we think about this. Most of us are, are, are well off. But it is a danger in having earthly riches, isn't it? It's a danger because it, it kind of takes our focus off of Christ and puts our focus on temporary things. It takes work to stay focused when you have a lot of them. How often do you go to the eye doctor for an eye exam? How many of y'all? How many of y'all go uh, every year for an eye exam? All right? How many of y'all go every decade like me? Everybody? <laughs> All right, fair enough, all right? So, okay. I hate getting my eye checks. It goes to the next thing. I get anxiety going to any doctor. Like, everybody tell me what's wrong. I can't deal with that today. Anybody else struggle with that? So, look. Now you have, now it's the, like technology today. You've got those, uh, what are those, the, what do they call those things? You look at binocular, whatever, the, at the eye doctor. And then, um, and then they just shut out one eye so you can only see one thing. And I hate that because you can't cheat anymore. I mean, literally, y'all remember when you used to stand like six feet away? And what you did was you, you tried to memorize with your good eye what, what it says so you could pack. Am I the only one that did that? I'm the only one that did that? Who else did this with their bad eye? Uh, with a good eye, go like this. At least we got some honest people in here, right? So you know what I'm talking about. So last time, um, last time I, I was standing six feet away, I was so nervous. My eyes have never been, never been that great. And I was so nervous. And Dr. Farley was like, cover your eye and breathe the lowest line possible. Remember that? So I said, made in China. And I got up out of the chair, I hit him, and I kept on walking out like a boss before he could say a word. Just trying to help you, okay? You have to go back, all right? 
unfortunately, you can't do that in the spiritual realm. Jesus is contrasting someone with healthy eyes versus someone with bad eyes. He's saying that if your eye is healthy, you will see the light. But if your eye is bad, you will see the darkness. What is Jesus trying to tell us here? The person with a gospel-centered focus will be able to see clearly. But the person with a me-centered focus will be in the dark. And the darkness will be so self-absorbed with self that they don't see Christ. The light is someone who's trying to see how they can use what they have been blessed with for God's glory. See, having poor vision will help you stumble through this world without the proper purpose for what you've been placed here to do. When you're self-centered, even the churches you attend and the books you read will cater to your poor eyesight. How many churches today talk about how you can have earthly treasures, how you can have prosperity on this earth, right? You look at Psalm 67 and says, Lord, would you bless me and have your face shine upon me? And there's a lot of preachers that will only sit there and preach that first verse. But you can't take God's word out of context. Verse 2 in Psalm 67, so that I can make your way known. So that other people can bless you. You've been given what you've been given so that you can be a blessing to others. And the biggest blessing that you can be to others is to tell them about Jesus Christ. People are drawing earthly treasures instead of heavenly treasures. So some of you need to get your eyesight checked and don't say made in China when you do it. <laughs> earthly treasures go against God's will. Verse 24. My sarcasm wants to go somewhere right now and I know I shouldn't do it, but my wife praying for me right now that I won't. Okay. <laughs> Verse 24. Earthly treasures go against God's will. No one can serve two masters since either he will hate one and love the other or he will be devoted to one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and money. Some people will protest. I can do both. I can do both. You can go after earthly treasures and spiritual ones at the same time. From personal experience, I can tell you that that doesn't work. It doesn't work. As you fall in love with one, you'll begin to despise the other. At the beginning of my career, I spent so much time trying to make money that I had no time for church. And then I fooled myself, thinking, and then this is what that evil one does. It's like, you know what? You can make money and give to church instead of serving the church. You're still serving the church that way. And the more I got into the Word, the more I started wrestling with what I was doing in this world. And when you look at the Word, Jesus says it bluntly. You can't have it both ways. You will love one and hate the other, but you can't love both at the same time. So Jesus closes out the section by really calling his disciples to make a choice. Are you going to follow me or are you going to follow the world? Are you going to follow God or are you going to follow money because there's no in between? If you're following money and the things of this world, you're going against God's will for you as a believer in Jesus Christ. So I exhort you this morning to follow Jesus and don't look back. To follow Jesus and don't look back. When you're following Jesus, it doesn't mean you have to give up what you are doing. It doesn't mean you have to give up, but it means you change how you do it. When you go to work, I'm reminded of Colossians 3.23, whatever you do, do is for the glory of the Lord. When you go to work, you don't look at it as a grudge, you look at it as an opportunity to be the light of Christ. It changes everything in your life, it changes your outlook. You start putting your trust in God and not in man, and it changes everything. So I want to close with a story and then a, and a testimony. This man went to a missional cemetery. Seminary, that's it. I'm <laughs> reading this book called God Smugglers. Anybody ever read God Smugglers? And, uh, and uh, so I'm reading this book, and this guy, he, he went through this battle. He lost the, the girl that he, of his dreams to follow Christ, and uh, which obviously wasn't the girl of his dreams, right? And so the first, um, the first semester of seminary is about halfway through, and they had to do a two-week missionary assignment, which is something I would love to do like that. This is so cool. And we actually do a lot of this. But part of the assignment that they had to do was they had to leave for two weeks from the seminary. And they, they were given a dollar. They were given a dollar. And then they had to go out and travel for two weeks. And they had to hold uh, church services. They call them meetings. <laughs> They had to find places and ballrooms to rent to have them. They had to provide refreshments. They had to pay for their own lodging and their own transportation to all the places that they went. Now some of you would say, how could you do that on a dollar? Well, here's the kicker. At the end of two weeks when they came back to the seminary, 
they had to bring back the dollar that they were given to start with. And they couldn't ask for money. They couldn't tell anybody that they needed money. And they couldn't take up any offerings along the way. Is that trust in God? It was an exercise in trust. But they called it a two-week evangelism assignment. You know, when this man came back at the end of two weeks, not only did he bring back the dollar that he left with, but he had a letter waiting from him from somebody who didn't know that he had a need with a check paying for his second semester in seminary. You can't outgive God, church. God does what God does. So I want to share with you as the band comes up. I want to share with you, last week I talked about how our meat source was going away. Remember that? And some of you automatically <coughs> thought, like, what are we going to do now? And I said to you that God has a plan, didn't I? Has a plan. Didn't I? Did I know the plan? No. I had no clue. Matter of fact, I just found out about it at 10 o'clock Saturday night. Somebody was watching the service, and before I could leave here, there was a message on my phone saying, we're buying y'all eight pork butts to start serving barbecue sandwiches to those in you. <laughs> right? They had no clue. And then there's a girl that I went to, uh, I went to elementary school back in North Elementary who we grew up two blocks from each other. And she goes to the Thrive Church in Chesterfield and she's going to Nicaragua on a mission trip. And so they're doing it. Crazy enough, a pork butt fundraiser today. And she didn't know we had a need. And she said, uh, she said Michael, I want to buy two extra pork butts if we're going to cook them up and we're going to bring them down to the well this Sunday and feed those in need. And they didn't know that we needed meat. I'm telling you that God, if, if you just step out in faith, God provides church. God provides every single step. See, we're so, we're so caught up with walking by sight that we don't walk by faith. I was sitting there at Free Food Friday. Um, I just parked the bus and somebody came up to me. Somebody came, and it looked like they were going to hit me, all right? <laughs> Which, some of y'all want to. I got it. <laughs> somebody got out of the car and said I was watching um, somebody that, that doesn't have a lot of earthly means. Just don't. And they were watching um, something on TV and they just said, God told me to give you this and just put $100 in my... They said, God's going to multiply this. So I got back in the car and they drove away. Then I got to Five Forks and somebody else came up to me and says, Pastor, thank y'all for what you do. And put some more money in my hand and kept walking away. I'm telling you. I'm telling you this because we're a church that I pray will always walk by faith. We just had a very real time of prayer at 10 o'clock. A very, very real time. Pastor Jafar, did y'all hear about the shootings at the graduation this week? Yeah. Yeah. Pastor Jafar was security and got and, and, and saw those two, two bodies. And he's broken. I mean, he's broken this morning from what he saw. And y'all, that could happen in Hillwell, Virginia, don't you think? Yeah. And I look at what I, I, I know that God can do. I look at what that I believe we're called to do here in the well. God's allowed us to do some amazing things with the unsheltered. But I believe God is calling us to reach these kids for God before the game's reaching. I believe that if we get them before they pick up guns, then they can pick up the, the sword of the Lord. And I believe lives can be changed by the gospel of Jesus Christ. Do you believe that? Amen. Amen. So here's the deal. Luke 10.2 says it like this. The harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Pray to the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into his harvest field. Some of you need to rearrange your priorities this morning. You need to stop chasing the things of this world. And say, I want to be a part of what God. I'm not asking you to make less money. Or give more money. God makes it abundantly clear in His Word that He wants your heart. And that's what I'm, that's what I'm asking for this morning. Is your heart with Jesus or is your heart with the things of this world? I'm going to ask you just to pray. 
Pray for us as we continue to push back the gates of hell. As we continue to reach people for the gospel of Jesus Christ. And pray for how God wants you to be a part of what he's doing here. You want to see change? It starts with you. Dearly Father, we thank you and praise you for being a God who loves us and never leaves us and never forsakes us. The God who is always there. You are the greatest treasure that we could ever have.